my name is Jim Weisner, and we're sitting out here on a deck of a houseboat on Issaquah Dock in Sausalito. Um, I'm the co-author, along with John Hewitt, of a COVID novella called The Roadkill Saga. And I'm going to read a sample from the book, but before I do, I want to thank Carolyn Parker and Driver's Market for uh, setting up this video recording. Allow me to tell you a little bit about uh, Roadkill. Uh, at the end of the reading, I'll say a few words about how the story came about. It's uh, loosely based on an uh, actual event, although emphasis should be on the word loosely. For now, what you need to know is that Roadkill is the story of a desperate escape by two women from a quarantine cruise ship at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. I'm going to read Chapter 3. Before I do, here's a summary of who the characters are and uh, what has already happened. Two middle-aged women, Monica and Allegra, are aunt and niece respectively. They're traveling on a luxury cruise ship called the Golden Albatross, which is cruising along the coast of Brazil when the pandemic hits. In Recife, Brazil, one of the other passengers becomes ill and tests positive for the virus. As a result, the ship is quarantined in port. Although the two women have made peace with the idea of sharing a cabin on a cruise, they can't tolerate the thought of being trapped together in a space the size of a walk-in closet for what they are told will be an unspecified period of time. So they devise a plan to escape and somehow make their way back to Mill Valley. Monica, Allegra's aunt, is an archaeologist, which plays a significant part in the plot. Her Twitter handle is Roadkill, which you'll hear in the reading. She's also an expert in accents. Allegra, the niece, is a professional graffiti remover, but Allegra doesn't appear in this chapter. So far in chapters one and two, uh, we've descri described their escape from the ship, but Monica and Allegra get separated. Monica ends up living in a jungle enclave with a Lego sculpture artist, an American expat named Spike. The two of them devise a plan to stow away on a ship that has just delivered arms to anti-Bolsonaro insurgents in Brazil and is about to leave Recife and head to the Panama Canal. Chapter 3 is titled, The Rusty Dutchman. What now, Spike? Monica asked, climbing the ladder to the finger pier in total darkness. I'm connected, he said, sounding like Tom Waits coughing up phlegm. When he reached the top of the finger pier after her, he pulled out a Havana the size of a cardboard toilet tube and lit it. The smoke twirled around Monica's spiked hairdo. Put that out, Monica said. You stink enough as it is. And what do you mean connected? Like your fingers are stuck in a toaster or you know someone in the mafia? Contacts, he groused. I know a guy who knows a guy. Know what I mean? As a matter of fact, Spike, I don't. Spit it out. And I don't mean that literally. There's a guy I know on a ship that's heading to the West Coast via the Panama Canal. It might get us back to Mill Valley, wherever the hell that is. What do you mean, us, you bulbous-nosed baboon? You think you're going with me? I just thought, Spike said. Don't, she said, you'll get a hernia. Look, Spike said, I'm thinking we stow away, you know, like hide on the ship. I know what stow away means, Spike. But as soon as I find my niece, you're on your own. So don't get any ideas about us, okay? Where is this ship? It's called the Rusty Dutchman. It's at the pier just down from the Golden Albatross. This better be good, she said. The two waited until dark, then speed walked from the riverside of town to the harbor via alleys and back streets to avoid detection. Monica knew that half the Recife police force was looking for her. The other half was sucking donut holes or collecting protection money, but soon the entire force would be looking for the woman now dubbed Patient Zero for the coronavirus in Brazil. They had to move as quickly as possible. When they finally reached the harbor, they ran across the open pier and hid behind a packing crate near the rusty Dutchman. Monica looked up at the ship. When was the last time this thing saw a bucket of paint? It wouldn't win a beauty contest, Spike agreed, but it just might be our ticket out of here. Monica looked but couldn't see a way to get on board, just mooring lines connecting the ship to the pier. How are we supposed to get on board this thing? I don't see a door. I don't know, he said. Look, Spike, I slid down a mooring line off the albatross. 
I sure as hell ain't climbing up one. Don't worry, he said. I'll signal my friend. With that, Spike stepped out from behind the crate, whistled like a magpie in heat, then stood on one leg, gave a three-fingered salute, spun twice around, made a long-winded fart, and ducked back behind the crate. That was your signal? Monica asked. No, that was me passing gas. I'm going to signal now. Spike pulled out a cell phone and texted. A moment later, the watertight door opened in the side of the ship, and a scruffy-looking, dungaree-wearing, long-haired member of the crew looked out. Spike stood up and waved. The sailor saw them and beckoned. Monica and Spike looked up and down the pier, then made a dash for the ship. They were greeted inside the cave-like interior by a man who made Spike look like Charles Bukowski in a tuxedo. You're just in time, he said, with an accent that Monica thought sounded like a cross between urban Peruvian and down-country Swahili. This shit bucket is leaving in a few minutes. Then he turned to Monica and held out his hand. Hi, I'm Eduardo Ramirez Sancho de Jesus La Rocha. My friends called me Eduardo Ramirez Sancho de Jesus La Rocha. Uh, the name is Monica, she said. She looked at the outstretched hand, remembered how long the virus can live on dirt-encrusted fingers, and decided to forego the handshake. You look familiar, she said. Weren't you on the Golden Albatross? I was sub-assistant to the assistant head chef until I mixed bilge oil and balsamic vinegar. After that, I was assigned to clean the toilets. What are you doing here instead of the Albatross, she asked. You're not the only one who wandered off that virus death ship, he said. It turns out that the rusty Dutchman was looking for a new cook, so it was a perfect match. In fact, they needed crewmen in almost every position, probably a third of the crew of the Golden Albatross is signed on. You'll see a lot of familiar faces. It doesn't matter, she said. I won't recognize them without their hazmat suits. So tell me, why are there so many vacancies? What happened to the previous crew on this crate of broken rivets? No one will say, he said, but the bilgers are full of blood. That's nice to know. So where are we going to hide? Walk this way. After you, Igor, she said. It's Eduardo Ramirez Sancho de Jesus La Rocha, he corrected. Lead the way, Ramirez. Ramirez led Monica and Spike down several ladders, then headed aft to a large locker that was squeezed behind two locomotive-sized diesel engines that were idling like a bank of MGM lions. It sounds like my head is stuck in a garbage disposal, Spike yelled over the noise. Thanks for the clarification, Monica yelled back. You stay here, Ramirez shouted. No one ever comes down here. Why is that, she yelled. I don't know, he screamed, but it's where they store the soap, cleaning tools, and paint. It's too creepy and noisy, she said. I don't want to go deaf in a lights-out closet with him, Monica pointed at Spike. What, Ramirez shouted. I said I'm not staying here with him. If I knew I had to hide with him, I'd have stayed on the golden albatross with my niece. She was a royal pain in the ass, but she didn't stink like three-week-old fish. As soon as we're underway, Ramirez yelled, you can come out of the closet. It's not necessary, she said. I'm straight. Several hours later, when they were well out to sea, Ramirez came back, unlocked the closet door, and waved them out. The noise was so loud, he didn't bother to speak until they reached the deck above. You're free to move about the ship, he finally said, smiling. Monica and Spike looked at him quizzically both deaf from the engine noise. Ramirez flapped his arms like a pair of wings and shouted, you're free. Spike cut an air circle with his index figure and pointed to his own head. Ramirez tried again, you're free, he screamed. Spike and Monica shrugged. So Ramirez tapped his left forearm with his right index finger. One word, Monica shouted. Ramirez did it again. One syllable, first syllable, she shouted. Ramirez tugged his right earlobe. Sounds like? He then showed her three fingers. Three, she said. Rhymes with three. Flee? Tree? You mean flee? We have to flee the ship? Forget it, Ramirez shouted. Forget what? Oh, I heard that, she said. My hearing's coming back. Ramirez shook his head. I said you're free to roam around the ship. What if we get caught, she asked. What are they going to do? Throw you off? Listen, here's the thing. I told the captain that you're my cousin from Uruguay who's working for the Uruguayan Secret Service and trying to overthrow the Bolsonaro government. The captain hates Brazil. That's why he left in such a hurry. He was delivering weapons to the anti-Bolsonaro insurgents. Charming, she said. So what you're telling me is that we're on an outlaw ship that's probably being hunted by the Bolsonaro Navy as we speak. More than likely. 
The rusty Dutchman made slow progress up the coast of Brazil. It was an old boat with questionable diesels and a leaky hull. The ship had been taking on water since leaving Recife, and it had started listing to port. On their second day out of Recife, with everyone learning to walk with one hand against a bulkhead to keep from falling, Ramirez came to tell Monica that the captain wanted to meet her. She followed Ramirez to the bridge. As she stepped into the wheelhouse, a short but muscular man with an overgrown mustache greeted her with a smile and a surprisingly high-pitched voice. Welcome to my world, the captain said. My name is Juan, four to ages. You may call me Juan. Uh, thank you, Captain, uh, or Juan, she said, as I think you know my secret agent name is Roadkill. Yes, I know, he said with an accent that Monica thought was somewhat reminiscent of Portuguese with a slight overlay of Mandarin mixed with Maori, probably from his father's side of the family. And you can drop the secret agent bullshit. I know you're not working for the Uruguayan Secret Service. I called my friend in Montevideo. He's never heard of you. That makes us even, she said. I've never heard of Montevideo. The captain laughed. You know, I think I like you. Would you like to steer the ship? No one, she said. No one? No one what? He asked. No thanks, she said. I don't want to steer. In that case, I want you to cook for the ship's company starting with tonight's dinner. Cook? I don't cook. I'm an archaeologist. Besides, I thought Ramirez was the cook. You mean Eduardo Ramirez Sancho de Jesus La Rocha? That's the one. There's a problem, the captain said. You see, I have a list. I'm good with accent, she said. I don't detect a lisp. A list, he said. The ship is listing to port, as in leaning in that direction. He pointed over his left shoulder. I need every able-bodied seaman to work the pumps in the bilge, including your friends Spike and Ramirez. Therefore, I need a replacement cook. You'll take over in the mess. I can do that, she said. I can make a mess. For the next week, Monica worked in the ship's mess 18 hours a day. It was the same menu every day. Scrambled eggs in the morning, bologna sandwiches at noon, super stew in the evening, and SOS for mid-rats. Translation, shit on a shingle for midnight rations, also known as chip beef on toast. It was the SOS that endeared her to the crew, and especially the captain. Her SOS was creamed in a toasted rum sauce, unlike any they'd ever had. The captain continued to grow fond of Monica. Every evening, he insisted she leave the mess and dine at his table. Since there was only one table, it was hard to refuse his offer. Besides, she had gotten used to eating at the captain's table on board the Golden Albatross. Aside from the smells emanating from every hole in the Dutchman, the major difference between this mess and the cruise ship's dining room was fresh lobster versus three-day-old fish stew. At the end of the first week, the captain invited Monica into a stateroom for a nightcap. As he poured two fingers of bourbon into each of two glasses, he told her, I have a confession. Tell it to your priest, she said. We don't have a priest on board, but because I like you so much, I want to tell you that I'm not one for the ages. With that, the captain pulled off his mustache. Jesus, did that hurt? Monica asked. Spirit gum, he said. He then took off his striped uniform jacket. Wait a minute, cowboy, Monica protested. The captain smiled and pulled off his shirt. Underneath the shirt was football padding, and underneath that was a bra. Something tells me this is more than you've ever shared with a priest. I am Juanita for the ages, she announced, and never have I revealed this to anyone. You are the first, my love. Monica was speechless. And now more than anything, Juanita said, I want your body next to mine. Hold on, Juanita for the ages, Monica said, thrusting out her arms. But before she uttered another word, Monica did the math, muy repito, in her head. If she gave in to Juanita, she thought, she could sleep in the captain's cabin and not on a smelly swinging cot in the cruise quarters on a ship that was listening to port with grease balls leering at her every move. She might even be able to get relieved of mess duties. One more whiff of SOS and she was certain she would jump ship and take her chances with the hammerhead sharks that trailed behind the ship for garbage. I am holding on, Juanita said, clutching at Monica's shoulders, but I am not a patient woman. What about social distancing, Monica asked, relaxing her outstretched arms. I like it when you play hard to get, Juanita said, moving in to embrace her. That was the beginning of Roquel's relationship of convenience. She had been right to speculate about her change in duties. The next morning, Ramirez was recalled from the bilge and reassigned as the cook, and Monica was left to roam the ship during the day as long as she bedded down with Juanita every night. For the next 20 days and 4,000 nautical miles, the journey to Panama was relatively uneventful. The Brazilian Navy didn't show up, and although there were frequent mutinous grumblings from the crew, 
No revolutions materialized. That's the end of chapter three. Uh, I'll just tell you that um, Monica and Allegra are reunited in Baja following Allegra's equally harrowing adventure in the Amazon basin, where she finds work as an interpreter for a European logging company, even though the only other language she speaks, uh, she w finds work as an interpreter, and the only other language she speaks is Pig Latin. Uh, the two heroines are taken hostage by drug traffickers, survive a war between Mexican cartels, make it back to the West Coast, steal a number of vehicles, including a forklift, an electric wheelchair, two motorcycles, and finally a hot air balloon in their quest to get back to Mill Valley. Um, just a word about writing Roquel. Uh, as I said before, it was loosely, as in extremely loosely, based on a real story. John and I have a mutual friend who went with her niece on a, a cruise to uh, Brazil. And uh, in Recife, they did actually get quarantined. Somebody on the ship got the virus. And uh, then while they were negotiating with the cruise company to get them back to uh, California, John and I, who we were in communication with them via email, and John and I started speculating on ways they could get back. And it ended up being an email chapter a day. John would write one to me, I would read it, write one back to him. And then when uh, both the fictional characters and the real characters made it back, we uh, put it together and uh, smoothed the rough edges and made it into Roadkill. And I have to say, in all the writing I've done, it's the most fun I've ever had, writing. And I've never, I've never worked in the absurdist genre. John, on the other hand, is the expert. He, he's written seven absurdist novels. So this was my first. So that's it. Thank you very much.